All right. Well, welcome uh, everyone to our fifth edition of the Keeping Your Business Alive During COVID-19 webinar series. Uh, my name is Dan Gretchen. I'm really uh, just honored to have you and to be able to raise. Um, we've been getting some uh, amazing feedback. Uh, uh, Ciara, I saw that you were on the uh, chat today from the business community about how this series is helping. Uh, and so we're going to keep it going. Um, we're here to give at no cost, um, kind of top level experts and really urgent information about how you can adapt your marketing and your business practices uh, for COVID-19. Today, we're gonna be talking about the Small Business Marketing Playbook with Alex Carvalho shortly. He's a, a we have tomorrow uh, with Venture Cafe, we're having our first ever digital marketers graduation party virtually. We're gonna celebrate the 30 businesses that went through our latest cohort of the BizHack program. We're gonna hear uh, case studies from more than half a dozen of those businesses about online lead generation, and we're gonna have a virtual happy hour afterwards. That's at 6 p.m., and you, you're gonna get a link and a follow-up email to that. It's also biz45.eventbrite.com. We'd love for you to come uh, for a dose of inspiration. It's really inspiring. The cohort, so he's gonna be there, and we're gonna have a chance to really talk about some of the best practices in digital that you can learn from these businesses, uh, even despite the what's going on in the world today. Um, so I, I see in the chat that my uh, I'm getting a little bit lagging. Uh, let me see if I can move to a spot that's a little bit better while I continue this introduction. Um, I'm in a different spot than I normally would be. Stand by. So um, next after that is going to be, um, uh, in a week from now, we're going to talk about Brand Love Essentials. That's going to be with Abdul Mohammed, a 20-year agency veteran. Um, and then after that, uh, in two weeks, we're going to be talking about social media video ads, tips, and tricks. Um, so I, I, I want to um, do a quick introduction of myself and then uh, hand it over to Alex for his presentation. So my name is Dan Gretsch. For those of you who don't know, I'm the founder of BizHack. I'm a journalist turned marketer. Uh, and so these sessions really kind of call to me, uh, take tapping into my broadcast experience. And it's really uh, been a lot of fun for me to do these uh, and to provide that kind of informational service that I spent most of my career offering. BizHack is a big part of the local community here in Miami and uh, soon nationally. We're partnered with a lot of the major educational institutions. We're part of the Goldman Sachs Accelerator Program. We were named a top startup in 2019 by the Miami Herald, and we work with a lot of the top companies and nonprofits in town. And uh, we're honored to be based here in Miami, here in South Florida, uh, and we're using um, the new environment of COVID to also extend our reach nationally. The biggest impact that we've had is helping other small businesses. We had more than 100 businesses go through our intensive program and they collectively generated more than half a million dollars in incremental sales while taking our program on an ad spend of just $17,000. That's a 29 to one ratio. And Alex de Carvalho was our lead instructor of our most recent offering. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what, uh, how we get to those kinds of great results. So without further ado, let's talk about today's uh, webinar. It's called the Small Business Marketing Playbook. We're gonna focus on getting you guys three things today. The first is Alex is gonna talk about adapting your marketing plan to the new reality of COVID-19. Second, we're gonna talk about how to stay relevant to your audience if you are maybe not able to do business or your business has changed, still being able to serve them. And third is optimizing your digital footprint. How do you make sure that you best represent yourself and your business online? Alex de Carvalho, as I mentioned, is a dear mentor and friend of mine. Alex and I have worked together in various capacities, whether it was on the board of FIU School of Journalism uh, or him uh, being a graduation speaker of mine back when I was teaching at Miami-Dade College. Uh, I've admired Alex. I've learned from Alex. I'll never forget the day when Alex was working at IBM as their head of global social media for their Z Systems brand, which represents uh, about one third or $30 billion in revenue. 
And he was walking me through the unbelievable strategy that goes uh, behind selling mainframe computers worth $10,000 on Twitter. And it was an extraordinary eye-opening experience. We were in Lab Miami and he was just walking me through pages and decks of customer journeys and customer personas. And uh, leveraging that experience, his experience also uh, in startups and, and working with many small businesses as a consultant, Alex is just an extraordinary mind, digital mind. But in addition to that, Alex has made uh, an incredible point for, during his time to give back to the community. And he has been, uh, he was one of the founders uh, of Refresh Miami um, with Brian Breslin. And he taught the first ever social media marketing course in, at University of Miami. He tells me it was one of the only, one of the fourth, the first four worldwide when social media marketing was just becoming a thing. He also founded Social Media Club of South Florida and Digital Media Assembly, and has organized literally dozens of meetups uh, over the years uh, for our community and to help create a community of ethical social media and digital marketers. The other thing about Alex is he uh, relatively recently was named the uh, Consul of Finland, uh, the Honorary Consul of Finland here in Miami. Alex is uh, an extraordinary background. Uh, from Brazil and Finland. He has diplomatic roots. Uh, his father was a diplomat. And so um, it's with really uh, great honor uh, that, we rep, uh, that we have the Honorary Consul of Finland, uh, digital marketer extraordinaire, and my dear friend, Alex de Carvalho. Thank you, Alex, for doing this. Thank you, Dan. What a, what a great introduction. <clears throat> Let me um, start sharing the presentation, just so we make sure everything's working here. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. 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 Okay, great. I see, uh, I see a number of my friends are on. Thank you uh, for joining some people from uh, around the world as well. Uh, I see Alejandro Corpeño is there. Um, fantastic to, to see you. Uh, I hope my, um, my um, microphone is working okay. Please let me know, Dan, if, if it if it's sounds not. perfect. Uh, also, Okay, great. Also, Dan, if, uh, if my internet connection uh, falls, I've sent you a video that you can play for three minutes, which is the time it would take for me to get back online. Wonderful. So let's get, let's get right into it. I have about 40 slides, so I may skip over some of them in the interest of time. I know we have about 45 minutes, so I may go quickly uh, through this, but please uh, feel free to ask questions at any time or put them into the, into the chat. Uh, so force majeure, marketing during pandemics. I mean, force majeure, most of you know by now, is, uh, is an act of God that prevents you from doing uh, things uh, that you normally would be doing. But it doesn't mean you should be doing nothing. In fact, um, you should now be doing those things that you were always putting off. This is the perfect time to catch up and indeed to get ahead. So Dan gave me uh, an incredible uh, introduction. Thank you, you covered most of the points. I'd add one thing is that uh, I was leading a startup of 20 people in the hearing aid industry called Say What? It was entirely about selling hearing aids online as well as doing lead generation for hearing aids. And I'll mention that during this uh, presentation. Um, So now, what's the problem? I think every company I've ever done business with has sent me an email about coronavirus. I mean, seriously, should I compare, care what a computer supply company has to say about the virus? Talk about mass U virtual signaling. It's everywhere. So people by now are getting tired of hearing how companies <laughs> are uh, doing good for the world through coronavirus. Um, everybody wants to be better uh, than the next one, and it's their version of a Hallmark card. Uh, is it sincere or not? So in fact, uh, more people are spending uh, time online than ever before, obviously, because everyone's stuck at home, kind of in this getting cabin fever. Um, however, people are uh, turning away from uh, local news um, just because they're saturated with more of the same every day. Just the numbers keep uh, going up uh, exponentially. Um, and people's time looking at exponential graphs has also gone up exponentially. Everybody's looking at graphs all the time. Um, I love it. <laughs> and so people don't really want to hear or read more about coronavirus. 
Uh, they're getting it from everywhere. And in fact, uh, by now, Americans are getting some fatigue about hearing about how companies are helping with coronavirus. And they're less and less aware of, of what's being done, just because all companies jumped on the bandwagon uh, really quickly. And, um, you know, if you talk to people the way advertising talks to people, they punch you in the face. It's a friend of mine, Hugh McLeod, uh, who runs the cartoon Gaping Void, uh, came up with this. So what can you do if this is the case? So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about how you can, uh, so the fact that you need to be prepared to pivot as a business. Uh, you need to stay on top of mind for customers and prospects in new ways. Uh, you need to think about your buyer personas and buyer's journey, especially the power of storytelling to connect with your buyer personas. And I'll cover what it means, what a buyer persona is and what a buyer's journey is. Um, and that's changing right now and it will forever change. Uh, you also need to work on your digital to-do list and also all your back burner projects and all that content marketing you wanted to do but never got around to doing. Um, and then finally, uh, still it's important, how do you make a difference in the world? Now, it's very, uh, it's very unfortunate because some people are doing some construction work right here just today, of course. It couldn't be yesterday, it couldn't be tomorrow, it's just today. So I'm sorry if you have some background noise. Uh, please let me know if it's uh, bothering you and I'll adjust the microphone. So, um, wordstream.com tracks um, what is going on in terms of uh, content marketing and, and SEO online. And they have seen some real differences in industries. There's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Some industries have really done well uh, with um, this pandemic. Of course, health and medical is in high demand. Uh, business management services that help other businesses do business. Um, also, you know, all IT support, um, HR, all of that has become really important. Of course, finance and some other things, greetings, gifts, flowers, nonprofits. But then we have some sectors, um, large parts of the economy are in trouble. Real estate, home furniture, automotive, you know, no one's driving a car anymore, so no one's getting them serviced, no one's buying a car. Uh, jobs and education, education has moved online. Uh, and of course, we know travel and tourism, bars and restaurants, conferences, gyms, all of these things have suffered uh, tremendously as they've had to close down because many of them are non-essential businesses. So this means that uh, these businesses need to pivot. All businesses need to pivot as people are spending more time at home and online. Uh, restaurants are now uh, serving foods um, on delivery, so they've had to pivot. Um, you know, just so not to close down, they've had to deliver to pivot to become a delivery model. Um, in New York, there's a uh, happy hour, uh, which is run by bartenders. And each day, uh, they run a happy hour twice at 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. And there's between 50 and 100 people coming on to Zoom. Um, and they have a bartender that's mixing drinks. The rest of the people uh, tip that bartender via Venmo. And this is a way for that community of bartenders, but also people who uh, would go to those bars uh, can stay together, even though they're all online at home. So businesses need to pivot and need to figure out how to, to do things. In fact, also, once we open up the economy again, there's going to be social distancing still. So if you're in some kind of a business like a restaurant business where people used to be close together when eating, you need to think about your user experience. You need to redesign the user experience. You know, we go to Publix and grocery stores right now and we have these scotch tape on the ground saying how much distance we can be uh, from each other. Um, but, you know, that's not optimal and, and grocery stores are not going to have scotch tape always on the ground. So they're going to have to re define the user experience of what it means to go to a grocery store and going through a checkout where you're going to be bunched up with people. What does it mean to go to a restaurant where you can't have tables on top of each other? So these types of pivots and user experiences you need to be thinking of uh, right now uh, before the economy opens up again. KFC is... Uh, about observing practices and why their food is safe. 
and what are the policies that they have put in place. It says my internet connection is unstable. I'm, I apologize if that uh, was choppy. Uh, but KFC is showing uh, and communicating about what they're doing to create a safe food environment. And these are the types of communications that businesses should be putting in place just to uh, let their customers know uh, that they are safe. Okay, be prepared to pivot. And now stay at top of mind for customers and prospects. Be calm and don't panic. No knee-jerk reactions. Um, markets are conversations. Uh, relationships are conversations. And conversations are stories, right? So you have to think about the human aspect of people. You can't just go dark. Don't go dark on LinkedIn. Don't go dark on your social media. You have to be present during this time as people are trying to find out what is going on. You need to keep connected with them, but in a very human fashion, in an emotional way, showing that you also are human and you're going through a story yourself. So are you listening? Are you listening to what people are talking about online? Who is doing the talking? Is the content accurate? There's a lot of false information, lots of stuff that's been debunked. People keep spreading all kinds of rumors and conspiracy theories. There's all this praise about getting mass vaccinations and getting chips in mass vaccinations and Bill Gates is behind it all. Of course, that's all false. Check it out. Don't spread false information. Be a credible source of information online and see what other people are talking about. What are they talking about in your industry? What are they worried about? Can you identify relationships? And are they meeting up online or in Zoom? For example, uh, the New York bartenders are meeting up in Zoom and some alcohol companies are sponsoring those meetups and the bartenders are creating mixed drinks with those alcohol brands uh, through that sponsorship. Um, so that is one way to remain connected with the community even when physical locations are closed. Adjust non-essential activities and non-announcements. You know, there's a lot of uh, programmed press releases and advertising that needs to be pulled because it's just not relevant. People cannot go into your store for the blue light special. So uh, you need to really look at what you've planned and what you've had programmed and pull it, uh, especially everything that's non-essential. However, this does present the opportunity for unique, circum unique offers because of these circumstances. So for example, Starbucks is offering free coffee to healthcare workers. I mean, it is a unique circumstance. Healthcare workers are doing uh, an incredible job at the front lines, and here's a special offer. So how can you as a business uh, create something similar in your local community uh, to your customers? Let's get into buyer personas and buyer's journeys, the power of storytelling. So digital marketing is all about discovering the relevant content that fits the buyers. What is it that the buyer wants? And then you have to look at what is it that you want and you need to meet in the middle to be relevant. So discover what the buyer wants, learn how you can help with their needs, um, get them to tr try your offerings that solve their needs and get them to buy offerings in a frictionless way. Today, buying your offerings means being online and being digital. So if you are procrastinating about making your business digital, this is the time to do it. You have no choice. If you want to remain in business, you have to find ways to bring your business online. Buyer personas is a way of talking about customer segmentation. So you might think of that you're serving women between the age of 25 and 35. For example, if you're a yoga brand, if you're Lululemon, you might say women 25 to 45 is a segment. There also might be guys. And you start to build personas. In the hearing aid industry, we had these six personas. Uh, our number one persona, we called Franco. He was an experienced hearing aid in, uh, wearer. So someone who was already wearing a hearing aid. And that is important because we market to Franco differently than we market to anybody else. If you're already wearing a hearing aid, we don't have to teach you about hearing aids. We don't really even have to teach you about the brands. You're mostly concerned about what are the new features in hearing aids and what are the financing options. That's very different from someone who knows that they have a problem uh, with hearing, uh, but hasn't taken action yet. 
they're still in that learning curve or even different from Jane. Jane is the spouse of someone with uh, hearing um, loss and she's going crazy because the TV is on too loud because you can hear her when she's talking because she's always repeating herself. So she in fact is more motivated than the hearing aid sufferer than her spouse to fix the problem. So you can see how the marketing would be different for different personas. So my point with this is that all your personas are changing right now. First of all, all your personas, their buyer's journey has changed because there is no physical, uh, there's no going to physical locations, especially non-essential businesses. Unless you're a grocery store, things have changed. And so the, the buyer's journey has changed, which means the places you can reach the buyer has changed. And mostly you can only reach buyers right now or your customers or your prospects is online. And so you also need to think about what is going through their mind at this time. So that has changed as well. Their concerns are different. They're going through their hero's journey. In fact, all of us are going through a hero's journey and I'll show that in a second. So storytelling has been with us um, from the beginning of time, from the time of uh, caveman stories. Alex, are um, I just had a sense. Yes. I, I had a quick question. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you had uh, mentioned that buyer personas are changing. And I just wanted to, um, you know, there's some aspects I imagine of a buyer's persona that, uh, especially around their behaviors that have shifted dramatically. There might be other uh, elements of a buyer persona that are immutable. Um, and I just was interested in hearing a little bit more about how um, specific incidents like uh, COVID can shift a persona and what elements of a persona are permanent? So the buyer persona changes because their concerns have changed. And so now um, if you think about uh, Maslow's uh, pyramid hierarchy of, of um, what we need, we start with food and shelter and then we go up the chain into um, you know, enlightenment or, you know, pursuits of uh, enjoyment. Uh, but, but first we need to think about food and shelter. And in the time of pandemic, people are experiencing a lot of fear. So they're more in survival mode, which means that other types of things are no longer top of mind for them. One thing that's incredible about the pandemic is that people used to have extremely busy days, like the entire agenda would be busy. Like if you wanted to meet up with a friend, you'd have to schedule for days in advance or maybe weeks in advance, depending on how well you know the friend, just because everybody kept such a tight uh, schedule. Now, all of a sudden, all of that has ended. Now people are now finding they have a lot of free time on their hands and they're filling up that time in new ways. So yes, Netflix has, um, has boomed because people are watching a lot more movies Zoom itself, you know, conferences just as this, like this, are booming. Uh, you know, uh, a month ago, people may not have had time to uh, come to uh, a conference like this, but now people are at home and they can schedule something like this in. So the way people are spending their time and their concerns are different. The longer this goes, the less... Oops, looks like we have a little lag. Hopefully Alex will come back shortly. By the way, guys, thank you so much for putting your information with your like, share, and follow information. Um, and uh, keep doing that. And what we'll do is we'll include a list in the follow-up uh, email that we're gonna send to our entire community with all of the different uh, folks that you guys mentioned here. And as in that way, we can um, kind of access a, a larger group of folks uh, and, and get more of them to like, follow, and share with you. Um, I want to, um, let me see if I can call up uh, the video that Alex had suggested. Um, let's see, stand by. Yeah, I'm not seeing it, unfortunately. But um, what I did wanna also do is talk to you guys a little bit uh, so that when he comes back, we have some good questions lined up. What are some of the issues that you guys are facing um, with your marketing, with your changing customer personas uh, that you um, would like him to address um, during the Q&A. Um, so if you could uh, go ahead and put in the chat um, what, you're, what you're struggling with, um, <laughs> uh, what, what you need more help with, 
Um, and um, I'm going to actually, uh, Alice Horn, are you there? I'm gonna no. unmute. Alice, can you hear me? Alice Horn? Alice, are you there? Okay, looks like she's not. Um, I'm just looking at folks whom I know in the list. Because I'm really interested, um, yeah, uh, Mauricio um, Rodriguez asked, what is an immediate way to transition from outbound to inbound marketing? If you could unmute yourself and explain what you mean by that. Hey there, how are you guys doing? <laughs> this is Mauricio. Hey, Mauricio. Um, yeah, so um, so basically, you know, my, my marketing up until now has been, you know, let's say 90% outbound, right? Calling uh, emails and then uh, in, in the sequence there, there are calls and, you know, the, the, the calls is where you really get to talk to someone and establish rapport and some kind of relationship, but people aren't answering the phones because they're not there at their office extensions, right? So if you only have the, the, the office number, you, you're not going to get to anyone. So basically out of, I don't know, 20 calls that, that we make now, we get one person to answer perhaps, um, or maybe 20 to 25 calls, we get nobody answering. Uh, leaving messages, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, right. we, we, we acknowledge and realize that it has to shift to inbound ASAP. Um, and, you know, we, we've, we've talked about inbound <laughs> before. Um, but basically, you know, we've, the, our, our, our investment has been in outbound. So, you know, how do we go to or shift to inbound quickly and, and cost effectively because basically our, our main budget um, was, was already spent on um, building an, an, an outbound engagement. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, inbound marketing is um, not something you build overnight. Inbound is where they're calling you rather than them, you calling them. Uh, the first way to get started with inbound marketing is content marketing, to create useful content that establishes you as a thought leader in your industry. And that's not something that you can do overnight. And establishing that thought leadership is not something that happens overnight. And so um, you have to invest in it. Um, you also have to um, make it uh, that content that you're creating uh, compel people to want to reach out to you because of your expertise. And so having a really clear sense of what your customer needs are and who your buyer personas are is going to be incredibly important. If you're going to try to go from an outbound where you're doing calls out and emails out to an inbound. And so the starting point is understand your customer needs and invest in content marketing and social media in order to do that. Um, Alice is back and I wanted to have Alice because I know she's someone who um, I'm unmuting you now. Uh, thanks for the question, Mauricio. Alice, are you there? I'm here. So Alice, I know you work in the transportation, uh, uh, sorry, the, um, the hospitality uh, industry and you focus on um, a lot of rental properties in the Orlando area that specifically cater to uh, families with autistic children, although you obviously have uh, other audiences as well. How are you guys attempting to adapt to this um, kind of unprecedented situation and the severe restrictions on who you can actually rent your properties to? Yeah, well, right now the governor has issued a ban on all vacation rentals through the end of the month. So it's a, it's a little bit challenging right now, although we are focused on, on future bookings. And uh, just to clarify, we do focus on all types of families, but we have a soft spot for uh, families with uh, kids who have autism. Um, it's been a struggle because, uh, you know, we're, we're juggling, of course, you know, applications for, um, for government funding and, and trying to do the marketing and everything else. But uh, we've tried to just really keep a soft touch with the marketing and, um, you know, in, instead of sort of marketing overt Disney um, images, um, we are, uh, we're, we're doing more sort of um, aspirational images of Florida nature and inspirational quotes and just kind of um, uh, images to keep uh, people's 
uh, spirits lifted. And then uh, over time, we want to introduce some promotional offers that are kind of future oriented. And, and again, with a very soft touch to get people get coming back once the market opens up again. I just wanted to say thank you, Alice. Uh, you're an amazing uh, marketer. And, and I brought up the uh, autism uh, vertical because you've done a really great job of hyper serving that industry that no one had really looked at before. But yes, you have kind of a general business as well and I'll serve other kinds of customers. They're just one of them. Um, Alex, uh, Alex de Carvalho is back. Uh, and so I'm going to hand it back to him. Uh, we just took some questions, Alex, while you were um, resolving your internet issue. Are you able to get restarted? Looks like Alex is not with us uh, again. Gosh, I'm really sorry. Um, so I wanted to uh, talk to Forethought Marketing. Um, and what Forethought said was, if you could unmute yourself, on March 25th, we launched a campaign for our marketing firm. We had 47 new leads and have trickled out a special offer that we negotiated, which includes HubSpot. So Forethought Marketing is an agency. Um, and uh, can you guys unmute yourself? Yes, hi, this is Suzanne. Hey, Suzanne, it's great to have you here. I know we had one of your uh, folks run through our course and it's really nice to have you on the call. Thank you for setting this up for all of us. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, and thanks guys for your patience with Alex's uh, technical difficulties. So could you talk to me just a little bit about how you're trying to, as an agency, create value in a time when many folks are cutting their marketing budgets? Absolutely. Um, we've been very fortunate that half of our client base are essential. We work with the Memorial Healthcare System and with First Bank here in Miami. Both of them are still running and operating and providing us with leads, at, or excuse me, with business, continued business on our retainer agreements. However, half of our clients are closed, as many of us are. Um, Fourth Up was established 11 years ago as a remote organization. So all of our team work from home since the inception. That was an easy transition for us. And at the beginning of March, when I saw what was on the horizon, the team and I got together and created an advertising campaign for the agency, anticipating that we might see a dip in our sales and our revenue coming in um, to offset that. And what we did was we created some LinkedIn, some ads that we ran on LinkedIn, all about transition. And when a, an audience member sees the ad and clicks on it, it takes them to a landing page in HubSpot, they complete a form and we gift them a leading remote document. It's like, how do you lead remote? And based on the experience that we've had over the last 11 years. So from that, we've had about um, 450 people have clicked on the ad, which has taken them to the form. And from the form, we've deployed about 47 who completed the form. We deployed about 47 um, of the, doc the white paper and have them in our lead base. So we haven't been sending them immediately the offer. We kind of let it sit for a few days, about a week, and then send them um, an, a personal email with an offer. We haven't had any success as of yet. It's only been a month and we've committed for 12 weeks, but I was concerned with perhaps our price point might be a little high on the offer and, or, you know, but it's really where we can break even. Um, so I just thought if you had any, thoughts on that. Many of our clients, like I said, are um, were the people that we think this would be good for and the persona that we developed was accounting firms, law offices, insurance companies, property managers, and things of that nature. Right. There's so much good about what you're doing. Uh, the, the fact that you're trying to offer, uh, you, you know, something that specifically meets the needs of your clients, that you have specific personas identified. Your question was about whether, how to handle pricing. Um, what I have found with pricing is there's some people who have no money and there are other people who have a normal amount of money. And uh, I would say in general, my advice on pricing is not to lower your prices, uh, but rather create programs for those people in need, such as allowing them to pay in installments um, or giving them uh, discounts if they're uh, in, in significant uh, trouble. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Alex. Thanks guys for your patience and for sticking with us. Um, because of the delay, we're going to continue past the 1.30 time. I try to keep the 1.30, but not today. If you have to jump off, um, I completely understand, but we want to make sure you get the full uh, extent of Alex's presentation. Thank you, and I'm so sorry about that. Um, 
you know, the internet went down and uh, it looks like Zoom might be having some problems too. So I apologize for that, but we're back online. I wanted to skip uh, forward a little bit. I was talking about stories and the importance of stories. Um, and I was getting, and I'll do this quickly. Uh, Simon Sinek uh, has a, a great video on YouTube. It was a TED talk he gave. And he was talking about how great leaders inspire action. And they talk about the why. The important thing about the why is that it gets right into the limbic brain, the emotions. So when we're talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and that we're all now like lower down into survival mode, you can see that that activates the brain, stem, the survival mode. And what's right around it is the limbic brain. So you need to talk to the limbic brain of people right now. You can't be talking to the neocortex and stuff. You, It's a very emotional time. And stories are all about emotion. This is how you connect with people at this time. Of course, storytelling is all about engaging the five senses. And everyone has a story. And everybody has a story right now, including you as a business. You have a story. So start telling that story about what's going on in your business. And this is the way to connect authentically with people. We're all going right now through the hero's journey. If you're not familiar with Joseph Campbell, he looked at myths and stories throughout the ages and most of them follow this pattern of the hero that goes on an adventure and then falls into great despair like we are right now during this pandemic and then we return the hero returns to the village a changed person the hero still looks the same maybe with a few scars but they're a changed person because of this experience and all of us the entire world is going through this hero's journey right now including you as a business so how can you connect with people by talking about your hero's journey and what's going on with you? People then will connect uh, with you better. This is the time to work on your digital to-do list. Everything that's been on your back burner. So not only things that you are currently doing that you need to keep doing, except the non-essential announcements, but everything else. Don't just go dark. Don't just quit everything. And in fact, now is the time to also work on those other things that you had been um, stalling. Um, you need to connect on social media, build up your social media, um, do it daily, not only by posting about yourself, but by connecting with other people, connecting with your customers and influencers in your industry on social media, figure out where they are and become social online. Be found online and, and SEO. This is a time to really boost up your content, uh, right? Um, look at the keywords, create the content, create your uh, presence, um, pay attention to the SEO, pay attention also to pay-per-click. A lot of people have pulled their Google ads and their advertising, which presents an opportunity for you to take over that market share at a very much lower cost. So uh, the cost of advertising has gone down right now, uh, including pay-per-click. So this is the time to be present on pay-per-click. If it makes sense for your business, if your business is digital, this is the time to, um, to keep uh, advertising. Google My Business and online reviews. So with Google My Business, you now can make some changes, including showing people how you're uh, helping in this period, also putting up new uh, hours of operation. And if you're closed during this period, then also you can change that in Google My Business. This is also the time to get more reviews for your business, uh, since everybody is online anyway. Um, and I spoke about customer experience uh, design uh, that you need to be thinking about. Content marketing, this is time to think about your buyers' personas, what they need, uh, how you can connect with them, and how their buying journey has changed because there's no more physical aspect to their buying journey. So what can you do online in terms of content information um, to connect with the buyer persona and to keep them moving along that journey? And of course, email marketing. And even email marketing wasn't important to you before, it is now. And you should have a customer list. If not, you should be building your customer list. Email marketing is, after SEO, email marketing is the number two most effective way to make sales online and to connect with people. Social media is third. So your content and digital marketing should attract and engage the target buyer Convert the buyer from visitor to prospect and always advance the prospect to the next step of the buying journey. 
so that they're learning with each engagement with you, they progress at their own pace, and they're building a relationship with you. And this is a time to build those chains online so that when someone finds you on Facebook, they might then see you on YouTube and then get to your website, fill out a form, and then purchase from you. So really, what we're talking about in terms of content is that it's not a single place. It's not just your website. In fact, your website is a very small part of the customer's journey. Your customer's journey has to do with social media because that's where they spend their time. They're on Facebook all day. They're on Instagram all day. They're not on your website. They don't care about your website. So you need to be present in those areas. You need to be good in search. And uh, also you have to be present in performance media, which is advertising. And so then you can see how people find you on LinkedIn, follow you to a video on YouTube, get on your site to fill out a quiz or test, uh, give you their uh, email address, and you keep marketing to them like that. So this is the time to think about this buyer's journey or this buyer's map and figure out for each persona, what does this look like and what content can you put in front of people in order to engage them. So you need to think about what information does the buyer need at each step of their journey? What does the overall journey look like? And where does each buyer start in the funnel? As I was saying, the person with, that's already using a hearing aid is already near the purchase because they're ready to buy their next hearing aid. But someone who's just learning about the hearing loss is very much at the top of the funnel and they have to make this whole learning journey before they buy a hearing aid. So where does your buyer persona fit into that buyer's journey and how can you engage them? Which, which of your personas are ready to engage? What, what are your narrative objectives at each stage of the journey? And what are your calls to action or offers and can you make special offers at this time? So for example, Aldi uh, and Publix uh, have created special hours for senior citizens and, and vulnerable uh, customers. Um, you know, they, they do this. So Aldi is doing this Tuesday and Thursday. Publix has it on Tuesday and Wednesday mornings. They're fully stocked so that, you know, when the seniors go in, they can buy their rolls of toilet paper and whatever they need because these grocery stores have stocked and have reserved those times for them. That's a really incredible way to think about the buyer persona, you know, the seniors. What do they need? And what can we do as a special gesture during this pandemic to serve them? So this is really good thinking on a buyer's persona and their journey to purchase. On Google My Business, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, mark as temporary closed. Um, you can change your business hours. You can also put in notices about how you're um, operating uh, at this time. You know, so as people are searching for your business, they can find this right in the search notices from you without going to your website. So Dan was mentioning a little bit about what we would do at IBM, and this is what a buyer's journey would look like at IBM. Of course, for your small business, it might not look like this or might not look complicated. This includes everything from social media and paid media and search traffic to the website, to email, nurture streams, to uh, phone calls, uh, you know, sales over phone calls. Um, of course, when you're selling uh, mainframes, you know, from 100,000 to a million dollars, you do need to have a pretty sophisticated buyer's journey. But even if you don't have a sophisticated one, it really helps to have that buyer's journey so you know what content to put where, what is performing and what is not performing, and what you need to improve and what you need to tweak. When you have something like this in place, you can measure each part of the buyer's journey and you can see where people are engaging with you and where they're not. Having a buyer's journey also helps you create a content calendar so that you know which assets, for example, which videos or blog posts or tweets, case studies, or what kind of infographic assets that you need to create and where you need to put that at which stage of that buyer's journey and for which persona. And once you have that, you can then fill out a content marketing calendar. So these are projects that may have had on the back burner, but this is the perfect time to start doing it because it works. Businesses that do this perform better. Um, and finally, how do you make a difference? It is still about community. Uh, Chris Clark, the chief executive of Bridge Telecom, about 10 years ago already said this, 
Although we're living in an increasingly globalized world, it is local communities rather than nations that are becoming more important. I think we see that. We get frustrated with how long it takes the government to send us the stimulus checks, and we kind of panic in between. And we notice that, wait a second, we should be banding together uh, as a neighborhood. In fact, in the little um, condo that I live with the neighbors, we're thinking we should just create a commune out of this and let's have movie nights and like let's just become self-sufficient let's plant our garden and let's uh, forget about the outside world because it's not working so local community is important and the importance is how do you make a difference in your community now that you're starting to stabilize how can you go back in the world and make a difference and create a better world so that's it for my presentation and tips i hope this was useful I spoke about pivoting as a business, staying top of mind and connecting with them authentically. Don't panic. Um, do the storytelling, the hero's journey, and connect authentically with people and work on your digital back burner to-do list. Thank you. That's great. Um, so we definitely have some time for questions um, and uh, wanted to um, kind of dig into some of what you talked about um, you know, IBM, you know, has a massive budget and huge resources. And I know that slide, uh, when I first saw it, intimidated me. How are you able to take the lessons and best practices of IBM and apply them to like the startups that you've worked for, where the resources are much more constrained? Well, for example, I went from IBM, which has 400,000 employees. Um, to managing a startup of 20 people. So we had 20 employees, half of whom were in a call center and half on the digital team. But still, what was important to, just as important to us as it was to IBM was figuring out who are the buyer personas? So who will buy a mainframe? Is it the CEO, the CTO, the chief technical officer, the C chief security officer? Who is that buyer? Uh, who is the buyer of the hearing aid? Is it the hearing aid user? Is it the spouse of the hearing aid, a hearing uh, impaired person? Uh, is it a war veteran? Like who is the persona? And for every business, whether you're a yoga studio or a bakery, a grocery store, you need to figure out who is your persona. For example, Publix figured out that senior citizens are a very important persona. And in fact, they can do something uh, specific for them. So once you know the persona, then you figure out what are their information needs and how can you move them along this buyer's journey from finding out about you to learning more to purchasing. And, you know, are there shortcuts? Like, can you skip uh, figuring this stuff out? Like, you know, if I'm a business owner and I'm like, uh, I don't have the time for all this, is there, is there a shortcut to this or is a shortcut uh, a, a kind of a, a false hope. And if you skip steps in this planning, you're not gonna get the good results. Yeah, so shortcut, a shortcut uh, might come off as not authentic and people might perceive you as just trying to make a sale quickly. Uh, in some cases that might work if your product is not um, you know, of high cost or high price then it's more likely that you would uh, make a sale quickly. You know, if I'm only spending five bucks on a product, I don't really need to learn so much about it. But if I'm gonna spend a hundred bucks on new uh, uh, headphones or a couple hundred do dollars on a digital, on some kind of uh, electronic equipment or a few thousand dollars on a hearing aid, uh, whatever it may be, then my information needs become greater and there are no shortcuts. Um, the other thing is, Storytelling is the way you connect with people and there are no shortcuts in the story. There are no shortcuts in a joke. If you want to tell a joke, you have to tell the full joke. Otherwise, it's not funny. Same thing with a story. You need to go to that story for it to make sense. And that's the same thing with the buyer's journey. The buyer really does need to have certain information at certain points in order for them to make that purchase. Absolutely. Um, and we have a question here from Harrison Davies, but I just wanted to weigh in on the shortcuts question. It is tempting to say, I'm a small business, it's just me, I have a few employees. Uh, I'm gonna just skip the customer journey, the identification of customer personas, the, the idea of the marketing funnel. I'm gonna just ask people to buy. Um, and unfortunately, it's not that these are 
uh, best practices only for large companies. These are really the only way to sell uh, reliably online. And the investment of time that you need to make is, in my opinion, unavoidable if you want to have efficient and effective marketing practices. And so while it is tempting to say, um, you know, I, I want to skip identifying my target customers, I just smell, I just sell to small businesses in general. Um, what I have found both from personal experience and from hundreds of businesses we've worked with is it just doesn't work, that there are no shortcuts here. The good news is the kind of foundational strategy you need for marketing is not so difficult that you can't do it with a little bit of focused and concentrated work. And there's no better person to do that than the owner of the business because nobody knows their business and their audience better. So Harrison Davies asked, can you speak to how to motivate and train your traditional brick and mortar customers to do business with you online, especially new customers who may not be as tech savvy? Hey Harrison, thanks for uh, thanks for joining. Um, yes, in fact, you need to think about the buyer's journey not just in terms of digital, but there are some offline aspects. For example, the phone, the phone. So um, if you're doing business to business, the phone is still important, and you need to connect with people on the phone. Having said that, you can orient people to your website. So if you find yourself answering the same kinds of questions, then you can have that section on your website. And you can tell people on the phone, check out the website, here's a link, you can find out more. So you can put that content that you're telling people online, and as you call them, you can uh, send them to your website for more. Or you can start uh, a newsletter so that you're keeping in touch with people through email as well. Um, and this way you can get more old school people online so that they're, keeping in, they're getting information from you through your newsletter or through your website or even through your social media? Um, there's a great question I got from Andre uh, uh, Nujo, uh, which was sent to me privately, but I think is a perfect question for you to tackle. At what stage should you invest most of your budget to attract customers through the buyer's journey? So at what stage in the buyer's journey should you invest most of your budget? That's a great question. And, um, you know, generally the very top of the funnel where you're trying to make people aware of you is, can be the most expensive because you're spending a lot of money to kind of get some people to click and even less people to buy. So that's the way a funnel looks. Kind of you reach a lot and it trickles down to some people who buy. So you can imagine you might be spending more, which is why any kind of content, search engine optimization, and social media you do at the top of the funnel works in your favor because you're not spending that money on media. You're actually spending that money on content, which is going to be there, which people will find and become aware of you. So that is one way to mitigate the costs at the very top of the funnel. And yet spending some money at the top of the funnel is very, very important. You might post on Facebook, but you're not going to get the reach that you need. So you do need to boost the post or do advertising in order to reach more people. So there's a balance there. But I would say that the most important part of the funnel to convert people is when they're ready to buy. So when they've already had a number of touch points with you, they've learned about you, they've, they know what the problem is, they know what your solution is, they're considering maybe a couple of other options. This is really where you need to focus um, and stop the leakage from your funnel. So if you think about a funnel, don't make it leaky so that people are falling out. Make it tight. Make it a tight funnel so that people really do go through down to your shopping cart, or to that phone call, or walking into your store. Um, and so that's yeah. why the stakes get higher as people come closer to purchase. And that's where you need to spend your focus uh, on those qualified leads. And, you know, there, there are two forms of marketing or, uh, that I have found uh, with the businesses we've worked with are the most cost effective which is a slightly different than which allocation of budget, which is really based on each business. But retargeting, which is essentially just saying, getting back in front of customers who through their online behavior, whether engaging with you on social media or engaging with you on your website, have indicated an interest in your business. So retargeting can be very, very cost effective because the audiences tend to be smaller and we know that they're already interested in you because of their online behavior. They visited a website or engaged with you on social media. 
But the number one most profitable form of marketing is upselling your existing customers. So if they already are loyal customers to you and you have a product or service you can sell to them, that is almost always a great place to start and to invest your budget. And I'm surprised that more companies don't actually invest paid budget into reaching their existing customers because there's some very powerful ways that you can target using custom audiences, customers that you already are doing business with to upsell them. Uh, the most expensive form of marketing in general is getting someone who's never heard of you, a new customer. It is more cost effective to get existing customers. Um, so I have a question here um, from Asta Business, Diana Ariza. Can you talk about strategies to reach out to doctors, lawyers, and accountants to offer the digital marketing services and social media management, especially now? So her target industries are doctors, lawyers, and accountants, and she's running a digital marketing agency that targets those industries. So I don't know if Alex um, is able to address that, but I can hop in while we, uh, he gets connected. So uh, Diana, when you're dealing with doctors, lawyers, and accountants, um, you, it really depends on what kind of doctor, what kind of lawyer, um, and uh, the, the way to, for you to uh, think about that is um, if they are a doctor who is able to do work right now, uh, then they're gonna be much more likely uh, to um, not need your services because they're probably being inundated with customers. If they're a doctor who's a non-essential doctor, um, they might need your services, but not really be able to do much beyond telemedicine. If they're a lawyer, um, if they're primarily a litigator, uh, the litigators aren't really able to go to court right now. Um, so they might have uh, constraints, but if they're bankruptcy lawyers um, or lawyers who are divorce lawyers, uh, there might be more business to be had. So um, in order to answer that question, you'd really need to really drill down into the sub niche verticals that each of those um, larger categories are in and then make sure that your service is meeting their specific needs. Um, we had a, another question here uh, from Jennifer Robertson. Jennifer asked, how do you market to a very specific customer like a for, Fortune 500, 100 company or a government agency? So this is a classic B, B, B2B question, which is you have a very small number of folks that you're targeting and how do you market to them? So um, LinkedIn can be a very powerful discovery platform. They actually have something called Sales Navigator. Sales Navigator is a system where you can actually search by company name or job title, and then you can pay to send an email or an, uh, essentially an email inside of LinkedIn to that person. Um, another thing that you can do um, is that you can create content that specifically speaks to folks who are in Fortune 100 companies or who uh, are working for government agencies. Um, and then you can create like a gated content so that they can only access that content um, if they log in and download the content for them. So there are different strategies that you can use um, to uh, market to very specific customer types. But to be really clear, um, the most effective form of marketing uh, when you're dealing with those folks is by telephone, by video conference. Um, it used to be in person, although that's kind of not an option available to us. This is why a lot of B2B marketers are finding themselves a bit flat-footed by COVID-19 because they were relying on conferences and trade shows and they're not really available to them right now. Um, I want to, by the way, give a quick shout out to all my 10 KSB fellow alumni. I see that you guys are uh, kind of connecting on the chat and I really uh, appreciate having you there. Uh, the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program is an accelerator program that goes nationwide and I was part of the Miami cohort 18, but there are nearly 10,000 businesses that have gone through that program. So um, we're gonna wrap up here now. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we're gonna do a couple last uh, items before we wrap up for the day. And I really appreciate you guys um, sticking with me. Um, I'm so uh, appreciative of the opportunity to do this for you. And um, so the first thing is uh, Alex and I are partnering on a five week accelerated course starting May 12th. Um, we've taken our existing programming, we've turned it online and we've updated it uh, for the COVID-19 
situation. We have new modules on SEO, modules on pricing during COVID-19, which was one of the questions that came up, uh, modules on content marketing and how to meet your content needs. And we're also talking about um, how do you leverage um, both paid and organic media to try to reach audiences. One of the statistics that Alex uh, alluded to up front is people have never been more active online than they are right now. But at the same time, paid advertising has actually decreased remarkably as a lot of businesses that used to be able to advertise have lowered their ad spend. So what that means is more eyeballs and fewer advertisers. That means it has never been cheaper to advertise than it is right now. As the things get restarted, as businesses start uh, standing back up, there's gonna be a flood of advertising and there's gonna be fewer eyeballs. And so what we're gonna see is an inversion of that situation, a huge supply of advertisers and a larger number of eyeballs to advertise to. So there is a little moment in time right now where advertising online is going to be less expensive and I expect that it will become more expensive. And if you wanna understand and learn how to do that in a fun and accelerated way, that's what this course is for you. So the, if you are interested in it, you can apply at apply.bizhack.com. You can go to try.bizhack.com slash syllabus to get the syllabus. And you can go to bizhack.com to learn more about the offering. And um, I wanted to um, also talk about some of the other upcoming events that we have. So tomorrow, uh, we're going to have our graduation ceremony for the previous cohort celebrating the 12th cohort of the Digital Marketers Edge course. It's at bizhack45.eventbrite.com. Next week, we're gonna be talking about brand and branding and brand love. Uh, and I would love for you to attend. It's with Abdul Muhammad, a 20 year agency veteran. And then in two weeks, we're gonna give you specific tips for social media video ads uh, with Neto Almanza. So um, it's really uh, very grateful to all of you for coming today. Um, if you have any questions, um, I'll stick around uh, for a few extra minutes, um, put them into the chat. Um, really appreciate uh, Alex Carvalho for um, presenting today and for uh, everything he has to do. And you can feel free to unmute yourself if you had a question as well. So thanks again, everybody, and um, stay safe, stay sane, and we'll see you here again next week. I really appreciate all of you. Thanks, Carla, it's great to have you on. Uh, Ruth Ann, thank you for joining. Jeff, uh, Bert, you're welcome. Andre, great question, Andre. I really liked your question. Uh, Marta, I'm excited to have you part of the next cohort. Uh, Jan and Maria, thank you guys so much. Janine, it's good to see you back. Julia, Gabriela, Federica. I'm glad that this was helpful to you guys. Again, you'll get all the slides uh, afterwards. Uh, you'll also get a recording of the session in case um, you were having any trouble uh, hearing the audio so that you can uh, get fully caught up with uh, everything. Um, I'm available to you guys. If you have any questions offline, you have my email address. It's just dgretch at bizhack.com. So if there's anything I can do to help you in this time, uh, please let me know. And I do encourage you, if you're trying to up your digital marketing, to take a look at the course, see if it's something that you might be interested in doing. Uh, really proud of what we're having to offer. And uh, we're trying to tailor it to the specific needs of business owners uh, in this time of crisis. So uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to say any final words as folks are logging off, but thanks for so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, everybody. Thank you for your patience. The internet was not my friend today, but uh, um, I appreciate that you were here. Uh, this was great. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Great. All right, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it, and we'll hopefully see you at graduation tomorrow and at next week's session, and maybe in the class as well. Take care.